So this session is a very diverse session, but it's also an extremely well-organized session, I think, because we started off with the 30,000-foot view of humans and climate change and risk. Then we went down to the national scale and climate change and risk, and now I'm drilling down to the city scale and humans and risk. I work a lot with cities. Right now we're doing climate preparedness with the city of Washington, D.C., with Austin in Texas, and with Boulder in Colorado. I'm going to draw from examples of these and other projects we've worked on with um, the state of Delaware, for example, the city of Chicago, and even Boston Logan Airport to try to place these experiences within a general framework. I love working with cities, though. And I think the reason why I love working with cities so much was encapsulated by my experience at the U.S. Conference of Mayors this summer in Dallas, Texas. Every year, all of the mayors of cities large and small get together in one place and have a really big party. You should see their agenda. It made me very jealous. <laughs> they have concerts by Lyle Lovett and Bonnie Raitt at night, and then they have like Shaquille O'Neal filling in in the afternoon so we don't get bored. I mean, that's what they do at their conferences, in case you ever wondered. So I went to speak to them, and I gave them a very brief presentation on why I thought cities might care about climate change. And at the end of my presentation, a mayor approached me from one of the well-off suburbs from around Chicago. He walked up to me, and he said, I'm a Republican. And usually, as a climate scientist, when somebody walks up to you and says that, you immediately take a step back. But he was smiling, and he kept on going. And he said, and I care about climate change, and I think all of us should. I just felt like hugging him. And then I felt like voting for him for president. But he was too smart to ever want to do that. <laughs> so we talked about how cities are experiencing climate change, and about how it just makes sense for cities to prepare. And this is my own experience around the country in cities of all political sizes and stripes, that we see the changes and we are preparing. So how can we do that? A brief framework. If we look around us, we know that not only is the planet warming, but for most of us in the places where we live, it is also warming. And these are just some basic figures from the U.S. National Climate Assessment that are available for download for anybody, so you can stick them into your presentations wherever you go. We know that it's getting warmer over the last hundred years. We know that our precipitation patterns are shifting, with some areas getting, average, uh, getting wetter on average and others getting drier. We know that our heavy precipitation is getting more frequent because it responds more strongly to temperature than does average precipitation. And we know, though as a climate scientist I have to say the trend is too short, technically, we also see an increase in recent years in billion dollar disasters. Why do we care about this? Those of you who went to my presentation yesterday will say, oh, this looks familiar. But you know that we have to say things three times before they stick in our heads. And if I could stick one thing in our heads, not just as scientists, but as humans, it's this. Our infrastructure and our society is built on the assumption of a long-term stable climate. As a climate scientist, I know that there's really no such thing as a truly stable climate. But climate variability over the last not just decades, but centuries, has been such that this assumption has been very effective and useful. It is built into our engineering codes. It's built into our water management strategies. It's built into our economy and our demands for energy. The problem today is that this assumption is no longer valid because climate is changing so quickly within our lifetimes that a building that was designed for a winter in Boston is now finding itself sitting in the climate of Maryland or Virginia within a few decades, and even further south a few decades after that. How can we prepare for such a future? Connecting it with cities. The first question to ask is how are our cities and our infrastructure already affected by climate and weather events. So how have we already seen ourselves being affected? If you live in Chicago, you know that people are, are win or lose elections based on potholes. 
Potholes are very serious issues in Chicago. We also know how issues like tourism even, public health, and of course flooding are affected by weather. And we know that these are tied to specific types of events. For example, wildfire, this is a picture of the Possum Kingdom wildfire where we had a house nearby that almost burned down. Um, rapid snow melt, hurricanes, heat waves, all take their toll on human lives and human infrastructure. They have re very real values associated with them that we can quantify in dollar signs as well as quality of life. For some purposes, this is all we need. We can build the resilience of our systems up through just looking and seeing what we are already vulnerable today. But for other purposes, we need more. And so I'm going to talk about examples from three places where we have worked or are working and talk about the framing that we use to pull together information to prepare for a changing climate. Three ingredients to the success of these projects so far. The first ingredient is who owns the project. Is it the climate scientist coming in as the expert? Or are the experts really the people who live in that city and know that city like the back of their hand? I would venture to say the answer is B, them. So it is essential for these projects to be owned by the people who are using this information, whether it's the local Department of Transportation, whether it's the local water board, or whether it's the city itself. Secondly, it's important to integrate the projects, not just have a linear transition between climate information engineers, policy decision makers. It's important to have us all working together, interacting, having lunch, arguing, chatting, comparing photos of our kids or dogs. That's a key part of making sure that this is successful. And then the last part is the communication. The exchange occurs in all directions, back and forth and across over time. So that by the end, there's no like, we go off in a hole, prepare a report, deliver the report, and it's a massive surprise to everybody who gets it. It's really important to have people involved from the get-go and to have communication going back and forth and around and between throughout the fabric of the entire project in order for it to be successful. And I define successful as useful. So what's step one? Step one is the idea dump. What are all the ways that you, city of X, are affected by climate or weather events. We don't talk about climate change yet, don't talk about global warming, don't talk about even instability or other issues like that. We're just talking about how are you already being affected. You get some standard issues, like um, emergency flood management, for example, but you also get some very surprising ones, like the mental health of emergency responders who are constantly having to be on alert in some areas these days. That was a new one that just came up for me a couple of weeks ago. I hadn't seen that one before. People want to know if it's going to rain or going to snow because there's very different costs associated with rain versus snow, and especially the amount of uh, treatment you need if it is snow versus rain. Um, how vulnerable are our rails to extreme heat? At what point do they start to warp and you have to shut down the rapid transit line? Do, will people show up to our summer festivals if it's too hot and humid? So we gather all of these first. And this is the most amazing learning process for me to hear about all these ideas. And this is just a tiny sample of the ideas that people come up with. And then I, in turn, share my information with them. And this is not intended to be legible to anybody there, unless you have super radar vision. This is just to give you an idea of the type of Chinese menu, so to speak, that I give people. I mean, it's, I call it that because it's as long as a good Chinese restaurant's menu is. And it has all the different types of climate indicators that we can legitimately develop from high resolution climate projections, which is what my own expertise is in. Then we integrate this information and we separate it into three broad categories. Category number one, we can name the issue, but either the science is uncertain or the impacts are too uncertain or both of them are too uncertain to do any quantitative work right now. All we can do is say, this is something that we're concerned about, but we really don't know what's going to happen. And a lot of stuff falls into that category and that's okay. The second category is a place where we know the direction of the trend. 
We might not know the exact figure for what's going to happen in 30 or 50 years because the scientific uncertainty might be too high or the uncertainty in quantifying impacts might be too high or both, again. And you'd be surprised how often it's the impacts, not the scientific uncertainty. And then lastly, there's a category where we can develop quantitative projections. What do I mean? Let me give you three examples. Um, example number one, name the issue. We know that people are vulnerable to small-scale extreme weather, small-scale in terms of both time and space, but we can't really develop any type of quantitative projections tying that to climate change. Or, for example, my colleagues in the mental health area are very aware of correlations between not just things like full moon and emergency visits, but also just weather in general and how many people show up for their mental health appointments. But there's no study yet quantifying that link that they themselves can use in their city. All we can do is name it. Category two, we know hurricanes are getting more intense but not more frequent, but how many hurricanes are going to hit Houston? I don't know. We can't make that kind of planning yet. People are working on it, but when you're working with a city, you don't have a billion dollar budget. You have maybe, if you're lucky, $25,000. So we can't do hurricane projections for Houston, say, but we can say we think they're getting more intense based on the literature. Lastly, we can develop quantitative projections for a return period for a historical event like, say, the Chicago 1995 heat wave. And we can develop quantitative projections for something like that, or for energy demand in proportion to heating or cooling degree days. We then translate that information from higher and lower scenarios through global climate models downscale to individual city locations. And I'm glossing over a lot of very technical science here that I'm sure everybody in this room would rather hear than this, but that's a different talk. So for an individual city, we typically develop projections using multiple global climate models, multiple scenarios, downscale to local weather stations that were selected by them, not us, although of course we retain the final word as to whether there's enough data to reliably use those to downscale. We can't use two years. I'm sorry, Cambridge, Massachusetts, but you should have kept a longer weather station and you didn't. That's not our fault and we can't use it. We had to use Boston Logan Airport for Cambridge and they didn't like it. <laughs> but that's, you know, maybe they'll have a longer record in the future. Yeah, true story. <laughs> All right. <laughs> we develop the base projections, but then we calculate the secondary climate indicators not based on the list that climate scientists use. We calculate them based on the list developed by the city. We have raw sewage flooding our beaches when we have more than 2.34 inches of rain in 24 hours. That is no climatological meaning, but it means a heck of a lot to the city. They know exactly how much it takes to flood their beaches. That's what we use. Our rails warp at 93.8 degrees. We calculate number of days over 93.8 with a good air margin on it because that's the number that matters to the impacts. And then we often iterate back and forth around this final step because then they're like, oh, well, I like that, but I want this, and I like that, but I want this. Can you make it a different color, but shorter, you know? So what do these projections look like? Um, this is an example for the city of Austin, just sim simply looking at summer maximum temperature. What we've got here is we've got the lower scenario, which in this case is RCP 4.5. But again, they don't want us to put RCP 4.5 there. They just want lower scenario. Higher scenario, 8.5. Range of uncertainty due to using multiple climate models. We do this for, say, days with maximum temperature above 100 degrees. You don't do this for Seattle because the answer would be almost zero. So again, this is informed by the client, yes. We look at seasonal precipitation. Again, this is, this is using three scenarios. And we show the uncertainty. And part of the reason we do this is to say, you know what, for spring, we have no clue what's happening for spring. Look at the uncertainty bars. We don't know. And it's OK to say that because people are used to uncertainty. For Cambridge, we looked at precipitation in the wettest five days of the year because that was something that matters to them from an infrastructure perspective. But for Boulder, here's the problem. Everybody in Boulder wants to know about this. But if you go all the way back to the beginning of the Boulder record, oh my goodness, that year is just out of the park. And we had to say to Boulder, I'm sorry, we haven't got much to say to you about this. In Chicago, we developed all kinds of relationships. 
with different factors that people have used, even in emergency response. We looked at heat waves, we looked at sewer overflows, we looked at how much it would cost to adapt to climate change. They looked at how they could prevent the impacts by putting green roofs on their buildings even during um, reducing the urban heat island effect, redesigning stormwater systems, redrawing flood zones. Bottom line, climate is changing. But even though we obsess over uncertainty, information can be valuable even if it doesn't have numbers attached. The key is to integrate it into what is already being done. Nobody needs a separate department of climate preparedness. Every department already has everything they need to incorporate it into what they already do, and that is the key to success. Thank you. It's, it's really too bad Cambridge doesn't have a university or college or something to give them some advice, hey?